Are we rolling? Mm. Yep. So this is going to be a behind the scenes on the guitar making, drumstick making music video that I did. Here's how this video came about. I ran out of time to do a normal project video and so I thought, hey, I can probably make a pair of drumsticks and record a drum beat and that would be the video, right? I could do that probably in two, three hours and then another hour of editing and then I could put out a video. And then I thought, well, what if I write a song around that? And then I pulled in footage from my other videos, my past videos of making the guitar and modifying the synth. And it became this whole thing and a four hour project turned into a two day nonstop project. And so the first thing I did was, I can't play drums very well, hardly at all. And so what I did was I started off by playing a beat that I could play. I just recorded it for a minute or so found the best loop in there, the best the, the best couple measures in there, and then just loop that throughout the entire song. And that beat is just. And so that's all it is. I, I found a good couple bars and then just loop that throughout the entire song. And I just played the loop over and over again on my computer to come up with a riff. And I found that uh, a car's riff fit over that pretty good. And so I kind of ripped that off. I moved it up. And then that was the start of the song. I changed up the rhythm a little bit. So then that riff turned into. And then, and then I needed a couple other parts. And so I just wrote on the A for a little bit. And that was the whole song. And so once I got the guitar in there, I needed a bass line. And I've never made a bass guitar, but I have modified the synth. So then I pulled in the synth and then came up with a little bass line on the synth. But then, um, then I wrote a little nice little uh, lead, uh, what I think is a nice little lead. And that became the entire song. So that's the behind the scenes of how that song came about. And I'm going to, I think I'll put it up on my SoundCloud account. I'm gonna mix it a little bit better. So let me show you my music room. This is this is all my main guitars here. Uh, my Martin acoustic. Um, Martin, they're known for making high-end acoustics, but this is the cheapest Martin guitar you can get. This is the guitar in the video. That's the guitar that I made. And that was all done in CNC. I promised everybody that I would make another guitar without the CNC. I also promised everybody that I would paint this guitar. I have not done either one of those things yet. I'm full of false promises. Still, bare wood. My wife, she really does not want me to paint it. She wants me to just put a coat of finish on there. But I really do want to paint it. It's nice grain, but I want to paint it. That's all there is to it. This is probably the guitar I play most. This is the Gretsch. Um, it's just a fairly inexpensive Gretsch. It just feels right in my hands. This is my prized possession. This, I'm not really into emotional connections with physical things. I try to detach emotionally from a lot of physical things, except for this. So I will tell you the story behind this. This is a 1964 Supro glass. It's made out of fiberglass. I've actually taken apart and it's hollow inside and there's a piece of pine that runs down the middle. So back in like 2002, um, I was playing in a band. Uh, we were called The Satisfactions and I didn't own a guitar. I couldn't afford a guitar. And my dad thought, that's crazy. How can you play in a band and not own a guitar? And so uh, he's like, you know what? Let's go buy you a guitar. And so we live in Toledo and I wanted to go to Cleveland because I wanted to go to some vintage guitar shops and try to find something used, something with a little bit of character. And then we found this place called, I walk in and I saw this guitar and I instantly, before I even picked it up, I knew that, that was, this was a guitar that I wanted. But I was huge into the white stripes at the time and um, this is kind of along the same lines. Uh, these days, they're kind of hard to find. They do make remakes of these, but finding originals that are still playable is kind of hard to find because many of them didn't survive the 30, 40 years because they're just kind of cheaply made. And so I picked it up and this guy, he comes up and he's like, oh yeah, 
Joe Walsh used to own that guitar. And I was like, whatever. And then I kind of ignored him and just kept playing it. Uh, he said, hey, uh, this is my last day. I'm quitting after today. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to get out of here early. He was, something about his job really pissed this dude off. I didn't even, I was going to pay the $500 or my dad was going to pay the $500 for the guitar. And he's like, hey, I'll just sell it to you for $350 if you guys just buy it and get out of here right now. And I was like, whoa, uh, yes, we'll take it, we'll take it. And he threw in a case for free for it. And then he points at the glass counter and he's like, I really hate this place. Just pick any pedal out of there that you want. And so I picked some some sort of a, I think I picked a tuner pedal and he threw in a whole bunch of batteries and a guitar strap and picks. He was, he was just, it was such a weird, like the timing was perfect. It was such a weird time. He was quitting his job. He hated his job and he gave me this awesome deal on this guitar. And I had this, this super memorable moment with my, with my dad traveling to Cleveland to go find this. And uh, it's one of those memories that I, that I cherish. And I'll tell you about the, the Joe Walsh story. So the guy at the music store assured me that Joe Walsh owned the guitar at one time. Joe Walsh is a Cleveland native. And he said that Joe Walsh sold the guitar to Michael Stanley, who's also a Cleveland native, who then traded it into this guitar shop there. My dad doesn't play guitar, but he just he just was supporting my, my music habit. But my stepdad, not my dad, my stepdad is a guitar player and uh, a, a Joe Walsh fan, James Gang fan, Eagles fan. He was very interested in this guitar that I got. And my stepdad actually is the one that um, kind of got me going and, and learning how to play guitar. And uh, he found Michael Stanley's email. Uh, Michael Stanley, who is now a radio DJ in Cleveland, um, he emailed Michael Stanley and said, hey, my stepson got this guitar from and um, says it was once owned by you and Joe Walsh. Can you confirm the story? And Michael Stanley wrote my stepdad back and said, Joe Walsh traded the guitar to me, Michael Stanley, for some guitar pedals. And then Michael Stanley then traded that guitar into I wasn't much of a Joe Walsh fan before um, before owning the guitar, but since then, I've become a fan. I have never been in contact with Joe Walsh. Uh, I would love to. If anybody out there knows a way to get in touch with Joe Walsh, I would love to know the story behind this. Was this used on any recordings? Was it just something that he picked up at a pawn shop or, or whatever? I want to know the history of this guitar. So that's, that's, this, that's the one physical object that I don't think I could ever get rid of is this guitar because it's just so many good memories and, and stories behind it. Other guitars that I have is just this cheap Fender uh, Squire Jazz Bass and then this National. I used to be uh, very into vintage crappy pawn shop guitars and pawn shop amplifiers, but I've sold a whole bunch recently. I'm trying to get over this. I need to own every, every vintage instrument out there. So now I'm using this Fender reissue amp. There's a couple, there's a silver tone amp down there, a little Marshall amp down there. My stepfather picked this up at an estate sale. I'm going to remake the case for this. And I have this huge bass amp. I got such a good deal on this guy. It sounds so meaty and it's even got distortion, which is pretty rare. Fun fact, the wood sides on there weren't even attached during the video, but I couldn't find screws to screw it on. So it's kind of, it was faked in the video. So there's the amp that we made. That was a fun project, wasn't it, Eric? Yes, it was. Yeah, so that's the amp that we used for the recording. Uh, down here, this is a AKG D112. That's a pretty common studio mic uh, that I have on the, head, or on the front for body. On the inside is a Shure, I think it's a Beta 52A up against the beater. And so you use two mics on the kick drum, one for the attack of the beater, and then one on the outside for the body. Classic snare mic is a Shure 57. And then there's an Audix i5 on the bottom of there, which is very similar to the tone um, and color of a Shure 57. Maybe just a little bit more attack than a 57. This is a common studio mic used for toms in many, many 80s recordings. And then up here, some cheap Shure overheads. So the problem that you have when you record 
and a house. In a house, you have parallel walls and you get what's called standing waves and it, and it muddies up the sound. In a studio, there's, there's very rarely parallel walls, so the sound doesn't get trapped between two parallel walls and bounces back and forth. Usually the walls are at angles and there's diffusion, so, um, so the sound, so that you get, you capture the room sound. When you record in a house like I am or in my basement, I want to not capture any room sound at all because it would sound, this room is not made for music. It's, it's, it would sound terrible. So I try to mic everything up very close uh, when I go to record and then do a lot of post-processing later, adding reverb, um, a little bit more compression and try to make it sound natural because it just doesn't sound natural when you record in a rectangular room. To, to minimize the room sound, I have these acoustic panels up on the wall. They're all the way around the, around the room. Um, like I said before, I don't want to capture the room sound. I want to try to destroy the room sound as much as I can. So I got carpet on the floor. I got these guys on the wall. So that is it. Oh, and these, um, these diffusers, they're, they're somewhat soft. So they actually ref, um, reduce more of the high ends than the low ends. And so it can kind of muddy up the sound a little bit when the high end reflection is reduced, but not the low end. So it's, it's confusing. And uh, I used to work, I used to work at a recording studio for many years. Eric and I were just talking about going to that recording studio and shooting a little vlog there, to show you where I worked and all those shitty metal bands that I used to record. Sorry if you're one of the bands that I recorded. <laughs> oh, so this drumstick right here, my dad went to go see Van Halen back in the 80s and the opening act, the drummer threw the drumstick out and my dad caught it. This, this bottom rack here, there's just, it's just a, a power surge protector. And then here's a DI box for recording directly into the computer. I have a headphone amp when I record a band and then I have a gate. So when, like when the band's practicing, you don't get the, all, all the hums coming through the mic. And then I have a feedback reducer because I'm in a really small room and it wants to feedback like crazy. And then the mixer, which it has like 12 channels. I only really need two. So it's way more than, than I ever need. Down in the drawer is just wires. As you all know, wires love each other and make love to each other and become one. So that is it. So, um, like I said before, I will probably post the track up on SoundCloud. Um, if any of you guys are into doing remixes, uh, send me a note and maybe I'll, I'll post the stem for you, the, the different stems, so I can give you the drum track and the bass track and the synth track and you can do some remixes. It would be kind of fun to see what some of you guys do out there. So that is behind the scene. Uh, if you like that, let me know. I want to do more behind the scenes of, of some of the project videos. And as always, be safe, have fun, stay passionate, and make something.